people wonder why my grandfather is a canoe. I am not confused, but proud of the handsome tattoos of Honui, his broad wooden back. The coconut senate that lashes the hulls of Pikikotuku and Faritoroa to his trim kuira torso. Plus, my grandfather is in good company because his nephew, Te Whare Huka Huka o Tangaroa, is a chiseled steering paddle who bucks and heaves with youthful defiance until loud by ocean swells. I also have a Papua New Guinea friend who says his grandfather is a spear. This! The Pacific Ocean is the life blood of our people. It's our home. Casting off on a two year adventure, carrying the message of just how precious our ocean is to us. Reviving the wayfinding brilliance of our ancestors and raising a new generation to become stewards for our ocean. There'll be people out there who look at it and say, what are these crazy people up to? But these are some of the first steps that we're taking to revive the knowledge that allows us to live in harmony and live in sync with our environment. The hardest part is to make everyone see what we see. And once we can make that happen, I think we have a chance. Actually, I might grab the mic. Sorry. Thank you. Can you hear me now? My name is Fomui Na Felolingi Maria Tafunai. I hail from the villages of Fastotai, Asanga, Salirulonga, Molifanoa, and Samoa. Though my feet were born and raised within Aotearoa and Otaitahi, so half of me is raised in this environment, and I give homage to uh, the Tangata Whenua who have looked after me and my family for two generations. And while I stand on this land, I also give homage to the Lalakia people, Nana Nanmuk, thanking Auntie B, as well as Nick and Sylvia. Ma lole soi fu ma le langi mama le kausinga o kako le kengako o le moana. And so, who am I standing before you, Indigenous Samoan, daughter to Ifopolo, Peti and Nivanga, sister to five siblings, um, and also? a mama to Oliver and my late husband Patrick, a wife, an auntie, um, and also a chief from Fastotai. And with that carries the obligation to act chiefly, to say chiefly words, to sit in conversations with chiefs, but always bearing in mind that we are chiefs of service. I have been a journalist, a poet, a playwright, an actor, an ocean sailor, a framework designer, a facilitator, an serial entrepreneur. All of these are the sum of my experience. And it's that sum of things that have led me to this place where I am today. I've also worked in aid and development both within Aotearoa, out in the Pacific Islands, and across in other areas in South America, the Caribbean, and Africa. 
This is one of my favorite journeys, uh, sailing from Tahiti to Rarotonga uh, with two, well, actually three celestial navigators, two of them who were sitting their exam to fish up this island, to bring Rarotonga, to find it using only the swells and the stars, and also commanding a team of sailors who are also dedicated to following all of their guidance. And this here, this man, and I think this is um, part of being indigenous, is being with our elders. This is Hotu Dua Barclay Kerr. When I first met Hotu, I said to my husband, we need to move from, Christ, from the South Island to the North Island. I have met, you know, my mentor. I've met the tohunga in our language, or tofunga, you know, the expert in this matauranga, and I need to learn from him. At first, my husband was like, is this you dreaming again? But then he met Hotu. And actually, Hotu and him became better friends than myself and Hotu. So um, I then became relegated to becoming friends with the rest of the family, including Hotu's wonderful wife, uh, Kim Barclay Kerr. And it's through the conversations with Hotu and my confusion at working in aid and development and looking at strategic frameworks and thinking, you know, I hear in the islands a lot that, you know, what we do, like a lot of programs fail because of the people. It's because of the islanders. We're very easy to blame, you know. Um, and I started looking at these frameworks, and we were doing work for, you know, the likes of World Vision, Oxfam, you know, many UN agencies. But they were using all of these frameworks that were completely militaristic. They weren't dynamic. They did not change with the environment. Lord knows what they did in the pandemic, because that would have thrown a lot of things out, because the environment then dominated everything. So we started to ask ourselves, is there something we can take from the, the magic of ocean voyaging and when you do it well, how that one of, it's not just reaching your destination. It's reaching the destination, hopping off the waka, as we call it, or va'a, and saying to each other, I loved that. I want to do it again. Let's go again. And how many times have you been on a program or a project, and by the end of it, it's not even the same crew? You know, if one of the success markers is that we loved each other more and we wanted to do these journeys more, like what happens on a waka, then we would start to determine and put things in that created that success. So we started asking ourselves, what can we take from long distance voyaging? What can we take from celestial navigation and move into a framework that could work on land? And slowly, this is the framework. So, for one thing, it's a whole entire ecosystem. Now, I see the cameras are out already, and I was completely prepared for that, although I did have a few prayers this morning that we would look to protect Indigenous knowledge and seek those who were offering it to make sure there's a good conversation at that gate. And we started to think about the island of success and the ecosystem that creates success and not just a dartboard objective of success. Who lives on this island? What do they do? How do they treat each other? Um, what are the things that are there? What are the human activities? And then also, is this an island we can replicate? You know, and the, you know, if you've worked on many projects, you'll see that, oh, by the end of the project, there is no replication. They're not built that way. You know, what can we scale up? When do we know when to scale up? And when is it a one-off? And once we've determined that, we go over to anchors. Now, I'm going to give you a broad look at this because I am going to dip a bit closer to it. So then there's Te Waka, our canoe. And today, you are the canoe, right? You know, you're the people that are helping organisations, helping people on the ground, helping your community go forward. Every canoe has a captain. And I know sometimes when we try and have this kind of broad democratic thing, that doesn't work on a waka. That's, you know, so you need a captain. And the captain's not like the boss all the time. But if there are storms ahead, then you need to know who is in charge. Um, and then we also have a look at what do we have on there, the assets. 
uh, the people, the skills, and then above that are the clouds of what is, where is their lack and where is their abundance? How do we use abundance strategically to address lack and to be always honest about this? And then every walker has anchors and anchors aren't necessarily negative. They keep you safe, you know, but you can neither be anchored and sailing at the same time. So there's a commitment to address those anchors. And in our model, those anchors are finance. And we all know that that can stop any journey. Um, compliance. And I've put Te Tiriti in there because I'm based in Aotearoa. Because I think that if organisations and leaders started to think of Te Tiriti as something I needed to comply with, just like filing my taxes, we would look at a system change. And then the last one is fear. And I think this is what makes this model a little bit different. It's because we're willing to talk about some of that hard stuff, some of the behavior thing, some of the trauma that people walk into the room. And when people say to me, you've got to work out your why, I feel violent. <laughs> I'm from a people where missionaries came, right? Missionaries that came with a great why, but then brought a lot of, you know, erased our history brought amnesia, changed our gods, changed the, our social structures, took away power structures. And so when people talk to me about the why, I'm like, no, no. Because it is who you are that is the most important thing. And I think in, in our cultures, like we say, in, in Te Reo Māori, we say, ko wai koe. Or in Samoa, we say, oh, wai, you know, wai oi. It's like, who are you? And knowing who you are means that you understand what you bring into the room, the possible harm you bring into the room. You know, and so once you understand that, you can then start to separate some of those things, identify them. But I think sometimes just being focused so much on the why is hurting us. Because the people that come and do community work in the islands, they come with a great why. They've learnt about the why all at the universities of a foreign university and then come and brought it over to my country. And I'm always about, but who are you? And then they have the cheek to ask me, well, who are you? Well, well I'm Samoan in Samoa, so I think that qualifies me to be in this room. So I want you to think about that. When we talk about, you know, who's on your walker, to really understand how you put people on your walker. And I also think that as an HR practice as well, is this a person that I could journey with a long time? Because you know that when you hire someone for skills, but they're a bit of a dick, that it's never gonna work out, right? Yeah. And I guess yesterday when we had the question about succession, I'm always for like, can, are you trainable? Whether you're a young person or an adult, are you trainable? That's what I need to know. I, will, I love all the schools you bring, but if you're not trainable for me, then actually um, you don't get to be on my walker. And then how we steer our walker are these things. I'm going to start going through some of these slides. So this was Island of Success. You can see that there. And then Te Waka. And it is the people doing your mahi. It's not actually your community, because you don't want to make your waka too heavy. Your community that you're serving are on the island of success. And you will engineer all of your activities for them to be there. You should also have your own families there. Sometimes community workers aren't very good at self-care, but also self-care of the family. So by putting your families on the island of success means you will make good decisions for them as well. And the values compass. So in our work, we create values compasses, and I know many people, um, organizations have values. We always connect an action to them that's very clear. So we have the act, so we have uh, three values in our company, integrity, which means we don't work for ship bosses. Because everyone will know, if you are working in the area of cultural competency, people just want you to come in and carry their cultural luggage from, you know, program to program without them doing the work. So, you know, I have to make sure that I'm going to take my walker to a place where all my workers will actually be appreciated. Um, and so that's one of our 
way we work out things. We also have the um, value of self-care, which is that we don't take on other people's crap. And that's, I know it's a kind of a weird one, but we work in the world of, um, I guess, some of the work we do with the treaty, with racism, a lot comes towards us. And even when we're dealing with young people, the trauma that young people walk into the room with, you know, often has nothing to do with us. The fact that they don't trust adults is not because of us, but we are there in the room and we need to know how to help them without taking all of that trauma on. So that's another part. And the other part is aroha, alofa. So in that, we only work with people we love. I love these guys. Um, and it's quite often after I talk to my team, I will say, oh, yeah, have a good day, Sam. I love you. I love you too, Fomina. So it's a complete love fest, and I don't think there's anything to be embarrassed about that. There's also room for hard talk. We have an agreement that there would be sharp talk between us. We don't have time to muck around, you know. So in this loving relationship are all the ways that they can, um, that we can make each other better. And one of my girlfriends says, iron sharpens iron, and we totally agree with that, even when that comes to me as well. Oh, and this is actually, you would have seen the Island of Doom. Can I get everyone to say, Island of Doom? Island of Doom. And now I want you to go, Island of Doom. Island of Doom. Exactly. And that's the way you should approach it, right? When we run these sessions, like, so when we run them with young people, we do relays. And so they run up to a piece of paper and they write down, what's the worst thing that could happen in my life? And when we read it out, we're like, oh, drowning, awesome. You know, and they go, oh, okay, failing exams, great answer. You know, we need to take some of the negative energy or feeling like you're the negative person out of their equation there. We need to be realistic and truthful about doom because knowing the island of doom and being able to write a five-step prevention action plan, I emphasize action, it's not a plan to make a plan or a plan to make a meeting, so a five-step prevention plan and then a five-step mitigation plan because we know sometimes even if we try and prevent it, it still goes wrong. So we need to be humble about it. And then the entrepreneur in me is like, what's the opportunity? What's the opportunity in that? And so the island of doom for me is the most strategic and giving island. We've, and I developed this because I was so tired of the cut and paste risk matrices that we see there. And also raising the alarm bells with, you know, agencies and go, oh, that could go wrong. And they're like, no, no, it couldn't, you know, we don't want to think about that. Or what will people think if we put it there? And I'm like, they'll think that you're actually got your eyes wide open, you know. So anytime, um, you know, when we do this, we're like, well, death should be on the cards. Long-term illness. We know that these have you know, ter terrible effects on teams. And then we have, actually, te whenua. So te whenua, um, oh, actually, before you do that, I just want to talk about the island of Do for one moment, and that with young people, we ran a session for our Wayfinding for Life, our suicide prevention program. The kids name whatever they want, and one kid named toxic relationships. And then that, their group, did the five-step prevention plan. Honestly, they should put this on the Bumble and apps. Yeah. And they had, um, first, uh, you should get to know them. <laughs> Second, don't go home on the first date. Oh, I was like, what? Um, also, have real good friends and let them meet them. I was like, oh my gosh, and go for personality. So, you know, these kids, not only do they know the problems, they also know the answers. Um, and part of that is that one of the things we love to do is challenge people when people got so got used to saying, well, you don't know what you don't know. I'm like, get curious, you know, write down some questions. Spend like, if you spent 10 minutes, everyone's got to write all the questions of what they don't know um, about voice to parliament. Write down all the questions of things you don't know about te tiriti or waitangi or about community development, just chuck it down. And then go from that base. Because I think that when we're unwilling to unleash all that creativity um, that comes from asking the questions, like we cannot continue to say we don't know what we don't know. It is harmful. 
And you, if you're working with, you know, indigenous peoples, they're like, right, this again. Yeah. Because, you know, I've learned to walk in the way of white people. I've got good English for, you know, a Polynesian girl out of Bishop Dale Christchurch. <laughs> and so I feel like if you want to walk onto my soil, then you need to know the way to walk and the way to talk. It's not a mystery. We haven't locked it in a box. It's all out there for you. But you have to do the work. And this is part of you doing the work. And then as we journey through, there's this thing, the emerging islands. And I think um, Darwin, the, when I hear about the kind of spam email, or not spam email, that was an emerging island. So as you journey through, on your trying to get to your island of success, islands will emerge, and you just have to decide, is this an island of opportunity or distraction? I always do this checking with my team, and I'm like, do you think it's an opportunity? And generally, 90% of the time they go, it's a distraction. And then I'm like, I thought so too. <laughs> um, and what's more is that, because you don't want to exhaust your team and your resources and the goodwill of them um, as you chase things and then decide, oh, no, we're going to divert. And then finally, finally, you get to the islands of doing. So the islands of doing are all about priority. They are not the islands of naming. You don't get to name them and then move on. The islands of doing about understanding priority. And the way we understand it in this model, we ask ourselves, what's the biggest hole in my walker? Because it makes no sense, right? If there's a hole in your walker, but you're up there and you're like oiling the mast because it looks pretty, but you're sinking. <laughs> right. You know, and so understanding that, being able to, when we work with um, doing strategic planning, we just drop these four islands. We're like, these are your quarters. Understand what are your priorities to happen in there. And then understanding what will the environment allow. So we knew during the pandemic, there was very little that the environment was allowing. But then you just went down your priority list. Um, <clears throat> and one of the things that, you know, I'm working with um, a government ministry at the moment, and we've just gone through this process, and then they, after they um, named all the islands of doing, they're like, what do you do now? And I'm like, then now you do it. They're like, oh, okay, that's, that's the hard part. Now you do it because they hired us to um, look at Māori engagement. If you go back to Māori and say, look, we've identified all the things that we need to do, Māori will sit there on the other side and go, yeah, just give us a call when you've done them. And so now they're at the, t at the point where they're starting to do them. And this is the last part, and it wasn't on the big map, um, but it's Mahitonga which is the Southern Cross, okay? And I feel like this is a really important part. This is the part that keeps you humble. And so in our workshops, this is what we generally ask. What did you enjoy most? Um, what bored you? Um, I have a niece who sometimes comes to workshops. She's very cutting about that. Uh, she said the map bored her, actually. Um, and she asks what, we ask, what we should we leave out? We don't want to waste your time. You know, so what should we leave out? What should we, should we include? And we take all of that. So I think the thing about sailing is that you don't want to sail badly every day. That's ridiculous, right? You, you, will be, you will hurt your body. People won't want to sail with you. If you cannot tie that knot and you don't spend the time, you know, when you're off watch to learn how to tie that knot, you're just going to have that every day, Right? So that's how we figure it with wayfinding as well. When we're out there and we're working with communities, every time we work with a community, every day we come back, we're like, okay, how could we do that better? And sometimes for my team it can be exhausting. But there's no way I'm going to go out there and repeat the same mistakes if only we'd sat down and paused and done this part of Mahutonga. So Mahutonga is also the constellation that leads us, a guiding constellation that takes us from the... Um, sort of northern Pacific um, down to Aotearoa. So I kind of consider that to be really important. Now one of the things about the framework is that it can be used in many things. And so here's an example. This is us at um, Orake Marae, which is Ngati Whatua land, uh, working with the New Zealand Coast Guard and taking them through treaty partnership. 
really important for those guys because actually Māori drowning deaths are the worst stats that they have. So they have to try and not just rectify that from a practical point of view, but understand what are their obligations. So that's some of the work we're doing. Oh, this is one of my favourite things. This is Wero. So Wero is our rangatahi our youth entrepreneurship um, program that we run in schools. We also have an eight-week online program. Uh, last year, it's a competition. We took the winners up to go sailing in Auckland. Um, and it's in the second year of development. And this is Wayfinding for Life. This is our suicide prevention program. Again, I was trying, I live in Aotearoa. I have a commitment and a responsibility to make life better for Indigenous peoples there. So for me, this is how we do that. Uh, and so we run this resilience program. It's the first time we ran it in Christchurch. We had one school term to set it up. We had 300 places. By the time we reached out to the schools, we had 300 on the wait list. Um, and so now we're going back to the Ministry of Education who uh, paid for that program and say, look, let's try and get 100% of Māori and Pacifica through. For Pacifica, we saw a 70% spike of um, suicides post-pandemic. So, and we already know the statistics for Māori, the worst in the OECD. So as great as Aotearoa may seem, and as great as we might be working in some sort of policy levels, what we're not seeing on the ground is the improvement of life and life expectancy. Sometimes when I'm asked about what does a treaty mean to you, I'm like, oh, it means that we could all die at the same time. Because then that means that everyone was in equitable, you know, living spaces, have access to health, you know. And um, I often don't, if I use that line during a job interview, I don't often get the job. <laughs> and this here is wayfinding for strategic planning. So we work with Māori tribes and organisations. So for me, you'll see that my clients, you know, obviously slightly tanned. Um, and it's because for me, this knowledge comes from our ancestors and I want to return it to the next generation. So my primary audience is that. We have used it, of course, with many other organisations. When I'm working with treaty groups, I'm actually working for Māori, doing the work for Māori to give them the benefit, but actually who's in front of me are generally non-Māori. This is Ngāti Rangi up in Ohakune in sort of where sort of um, Mount Ruapehu in the centre of the North Island. And then... We have this kind of other things we do is looking at how does wayfinding also assist trying to resolve the problem of space junk. So working with astrodynamicists. And aside from what I say, I don't understand what anyone else says in that entire... Uh, <laughs> like when they talk about data points and there's like, you know, a constellation, you know, sort of, of thousands of data points, I just wait till it's my turn out of the green room. But what we bring in that conversation are those sensibilities of knowing that in indigenous frameworks that they're not only they're holistic, they're not time bound, they're also not space bound. The idea that there is outer space comes from a Western ideology. You know, for us, the space that, you know, the constellations are part of who we are. They've, they've guided us, they speak to us. Um, they are part of the environment just like the moana, just like the sea and just like the land. And then last year, so for me, it's not just to sail, it's actually to build as well. I did a workshop where they taught us how to lash, and lash in the style of canoes. This, so this is my lashing, actually. And this is what we lashed together. And then a man who was about 100 kilos stood on top of that. And that inspired me to do this. So that, um, that uh, conference was in December, and then I rang my dad and said, Dad, I'm going to come to Samoa. I'm going to build a canoe. Can you find me a tree and some canoe builders? Dad's like, yes. My dad had four girls before the two boys arrived. So one, he's used to a lot of women asking him to do things. Um, 
But also, he doesn't really see the difference between, I guess, the gender roles. Um, and that's actually my father there, and um, third wife, he's the marrying kind. Um, <laughs> but to be fair, the other two passed away, and so, um, and Alo, who's in the back, her son is in this top part over here, and so I'm actually building a canoe with my brother, which I think is a wonderful thing to do. And the tree comes from our land. We felled it, we sat in the forest, we carved for days, we brought it down. This whole experience for our village is one of, I guess when we talk about that why, it's taking back some of that was lost. When we finish with this canoe, which will be a sailing canoe, it'll be one of the first, it'll be actually the first in hundreds of years in Samoa to sail. And people said to me, oh, are you going to sail over to, you know, way over to Savai or sail to Tonga? And I'm like, no, I just want to sail in my local waters. I just want to do what my ancestors did every day. And so for me, you know, being a walker girl takes me to that next part. And so there's an invitation. We need more frameworks. So before I got on the plane here, and I do have to do a little shout out for Denise and Tana for inviting me to come here and share my story. Um, I wrote on Facebook, I don't want to use Agile, Lean Canvas, Flow, Scrum. I don't want to use them. I just want to use indigenous frameworks. And so for that to happen, I feel there should be more. But I have seen them. I have seen some. And I think there's a... You know, sometimes we can be, it's like a post-colonization, we can be just like enraptured with like something and we're just like, oh, if I translate that, if I use my indigenous words on top of that framework, it's going to make it indigenous. And so that's what I'm saying. We're better than the translated ones. We're better than ones where we take something out of our culture that, that we feel is resonant with us, but we have no experience of. Yesterday, when I was in the session with Natasha in Living Arts, thank you very much. I hope you appreciate my earrings that I made. Um, Natasha talked about weaving. And she talked about the, the cultural understanding of people as they weave and how that relates to um, you know, uh, her people. And for me, like, that almost brought me to tears because that is how I created my framework in a deep understanding and exploration of sailing and voyaging and navigation and to have the conversation with the elders. And so I think that, yes, we can, I'd love to see more. And so I wanted to ask, um, can I get a time check? Oh. <laughs> Oh, sorry, you're there. Am I already out? <laughs> oh, sorry, I didn't know where to look. <laughs> okay, so I'll just leave this with us, actually, because I think that one of the things that I want, and maybe to, for you to write down is like, what should our frameworks look like? But also this, if you are developing a framework, what's on your island of doom as you develop it? How do you write a five-step prevention plan to keep yourself in good, um, I don't know that word, but, um, but basically um, that you would know that your elders approve? And, you know, if it goes wrong, how do you mitigate? And what's the opportunity? As I created mine, I listened and listened to everybody. And I, I was challenged many times, and all those challenges just made the framework better. So I will, you know, invite you. If you want to, you know, have a chat to me later on, um, then you're welcome to do that. But, yeah, we need more frameworks. And um, I'm going to finish with this, um, and it's going to take, like, 10 seconds. Um, All right. Right, as a Samoan, without a microphone, I'm going to just shout. So I feel like you might need to just have a little bit of energy before our next speaker. So if I can get you to rub your hands. Mealy, 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 mealy. 